welcome to Movable Dough. This is Steve Danielson. Join me each week as we explore the minds of living composers. We talk about their lives, their musical journeys, and of course, their music. For a complete archive of episodes, as well as access to the shorter segments called Movable Snippets, visit my website, sdcompose.com slash movable dough. Hey, this is Steve. Thanks for joining me for this episode of Movable Dough. My guest today is Justine Kuntz. Justine completed a bachelor's degree in music theory and composition at McDaniel College and a master's in choral conducting and composition from Butler University. Her compositions, mostly for choir and chamber ensembles, have been performed at local, national, and international venues, including performances at the 2019 London Festival of Contemporary Music, the 2018 Intercollegiate Men's Chorus National Seminar, and the 2012 World Choir Games. In addition to composing, Justine is also a conductor and is interested in premiering new works. She has been the music minister at Memorial Episcopal Church in Baltimore since 2018. Justine Kuntz, welcome to Movable Dough. Thank you for having me. So you actually made your debut on this program a couple months ago when uh, when your piece Insomnia was featured as a movable snippet. So that one, as well as many of your other works, are for choirs. And so I wanted to start with what is it about choral music that you find particularly compelling that keeps bringing you back to it? I think the first reason for me is text. Um, You can't set text for chamber ensemble. And I think that goes back to my great love of reading and texts and um, just exploring meaning through the written word. Choral music feels like an elevation of that. Were you doing choral music in, in high school? Were you growing up in choral music? Or? No, this is funny. Um, I didn't start singing in choirs until I was 19. It was my junior year in college. And the reason for that was I really had never been exposed to it as a kid. I went to a private school where we had music on and off. I was then homeschooled for high school. So the the access points that I think a a normal um, composer would have had to choirs um, or instrumental ensembles for that matter was was quite limited. Mm. Um, And the other thing, and I feel really catty saying this, but vocal music just wasn't a thing we did at home. (laughs) So... It, it, when, when I went to college and was getting invited to play guitar on the choral concerts or went, just attended the choral concerts, it, it felt a little bit like the forbidden fruit and I must have that. <laughs> so junior year, I finally got the courage to sign up for choir and voice class and the rest is history. Oh, wow. So you, you mentioned playing guitar for choral ensembles. Mm-hmm. Uh, your, your primary instrument is classical guitar, correct? That's right. So did you start on that at a, at a very young age? No, I was, I think I was 15. Um, music was something that um, was around in my childhood, but it was something that it, nobody shoved a guitar in my hand at five or a violin in my hand at two. Um, it, it was something that uh, I was gradually exposed to. I think a big turning point was, I think it was 11. My parents ended up getting me a keyboard for Christmas and it had some very basic recording functions. And I, I recorded stuff. And I very quickly ran through the six tracks that you were permitted to record on on this, on this little Casio, I think it was. And so that, that kind of led me down the composing road. And um, I did a lot of uh, tinkering with music production at home for many years. Okay. So what was it about the guitar that you think spoke to you first? I think that my parents would tolerate it uh, being played in the house. (laughs) Uh, I don't know. I think there was one, my mother had this, this uh, very old beater that I think she'd gotten uh, as a kid. So there was just one around. Um, I liked the idea of chords. It it was something I didn't get lessons for a very long time. I just had a, a book and I taught myself some chords out of it. Um, but the thing I really like about it now is it's, it's part of every genre. You can play mm-hmm. whatever whatever you want on it. Yeah. So if you weren't sort of thinking about music when you were really young, thinking about co- composition as a career, what what was it that you wanted to be when you were when you were really little? I so the first thing I wanted to be when I grew up was a doctor, um, which is hilarious to me now because I have a very <laughs> weak stomach. <laughs> um, but I think that notion of making people feel better. Uh huh has always been part of my 
aesthetic as as a musician. Um, gosh, I was I was the kid who was really into books. I was always regarded as the brain. So uh, doing something intellectual seemed pretty obvious from from the start. And I also had this big fascination for the performing arts. We actually did a mandatory school play at the, the school I went to, and I seemed to be the only kid that remotely enjoyed doing that. And I started taking dance classes when I was about 10 and fell in love with that. And I actually thought I was going to become a choreographer. Um, but I also realized that dance has a very short, dancers have very short career spans and musicians have very long ones. So e even though when you're 15, you're not really thinking about being 30 and having to find a new career, that, that notion had entered my mind and it seemed like, well, if I like other things, maybe I should be doing other things instead of this one thing that I can't do for very long. That's interesting. So from doctor to choreographer to musician. That's a, <laughs> oh, and there are many other stops in between. <laughs> there, there was a, a writer was in there and that, that seems very obvious having become a composer. Um, I wanted to become a chef at some point. I, I made many stops along, <laughs> along the way. That's awesome. Uh, so when do you, you know, when did you decide that composing was sort of the direction you wanted to sort of make your main focus? I, th I think it was around 15 or 16. I had messed around with the recording on the keyboard and liked doing that. I've always been the person who's into creating things. So naturally, when I started taking guitar lessons and getting involved in music, it, it was fairly evident that I was going to be creating it somehow. Um, and I think also my father, who's also a musician, um, was very encouraging and kind of said, this would, this would be a good direction for you to go. Well, that's great to have that encouragement from someone. Yeah. So I know one of your areas of interest led you to a Fulbright scholarship for mm -hmm. a year studying the singing culture of Latvia. So tell us a little bit about that experience. What did you learn while you were there? I went, I was very curious about getting a second perspective on what choral music could mean. And I think in the US, we've cobbled our choir culture together out of um, other cultures, our interest in, in community, but I really wanted to know what was it like just to have it in the air? Mm -hmm. um, what, what were they doing differently? How did they experience it differently? And uh, frankly, I think I came back with a lot more questions, particularly about the way we do things here. Um, so my, my big takeaway from that experience was there are other ways of doing things. Um, there are very deep relationships that not only a person can have with the work, but with the, a culture um, that the culture can have with the work. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I haven't thought about it in a while. The, the thing that was really exciting was it was actually the year after they have over in the Baltics, uh, song festivals that are every five years and following year 2018 I was able to go back and sing with the song festival. Song festivals are usually at minimum about 10,000 singers on the stage and this was a very important year. It was the 100 year uh, declaration of freedom anniversary so everybody came back for that and I think we were I was on stage with about 15,000 other singers yeah those is, singing festivals are amazing it's mind-blowing absolutely amazing so do you think that there was something that you drew from that that is evident in your composition style now or do you think about those sort of things as you're composing for choirs the direction my work is tending to go in and it might be a result of that year in latvia is I'm getting much more specific about people's experiences and, and what I want people to, what I want people to feel, what the text is about, uh, where the piece is meeting a person rather than a community. Hmm. Um, 
Whereas I feel like a lot of compositions we see now coming up in, in the, the American choral culture tend to be a little more generic. And I find I'm getting more interested in the specificity. And part of give, that- Give me an example. What do you mean? Actually, insomnia is a really good example, even though I wrote that before I left, this was, this was still very much on my mind. Um, insomnia is about one person having a really bad night. And I think a listener can hear that and relate to it in any number of different ways. You know, I've had a bad night. I've had a breakup. I'm thinking very deep thoughts and it's making me feel very isolated. Whereas I feel like the, the genericness kind of says, this is the takeaway that you should have. Yeah. Well, I definitely felt that when I listened to insomnia, I've actually been struggling Good. with insomnia this summer. And so the... <laughs> Perfect. The, the piece was perfectly timed for me. <laughs> uh, so currently all of your music is self-published on your website. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think you'll ever try to go through a traditional publisher or will you stay self-published and, and why? Here's the thing. I like doing the business side of things. Uh -huh. I like networking. I like talking to people about my music. And currently I also have the time to be taking care of those things. I, th I think you seek a traditional publisher if you're not good at those elements, which is fine. And also if you simply don't have the time, if, if you're doing a full-time high school gig, for example, and, and simply don't have the time to do it. The other thing was when I was, I guess graduating college and trying to figure out how do I get my music out there, self-publishing was starting to become a more acceptable way to go. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess it feels right. I'm not sure that that handing over my baby to somebody <laughs> else to take care of feels right to me. Sure. Well, as a, as a fellow composer that also self-publishes almost everything I have, what have you found to be the most effective way to market your music to composers? Talking to people, networking, just building relationships. Is this like going to conventions or? Going or, to or conventions. What? Um, going to conventions, going to concerts and talking to other people, um, taking people up on their offer of, um, Hey, I'd like to look at your music. And I'm, I'm shocked as a director, whenever I make, whenever I make the, the offer of, Hey, send me something. <laughs> I usually don't get anything. <laughs> <laughs> so, so send people stuff if they, if they, uh, say they're interested. Very cool. So you write on your website that your music is both accessible and diverse. What do you mean by that? Accessible to whom and <laughs> diverse in what way? That's very vague of me, isn't it? <laughs> Bring it to the specifics. Sure. Um, diverse in the sense that I don't have a, a particular sound. I don't sound like, um, you know, you can listen to a piece by Whitaker or Lauritsen to, to pick on those guys. And, and no, it's by them. Whereas I tend, I tend to get bored by writing in just one particular way or one particular sound. So that's the diverse part. I think the accessible part is actually there not to scare people away. Because mm. uh, when you're in the new music community, um, you hear everything. And I think the accessible is an invitation that I'm, I'm not the person who's trying to find all of the really high pitches on the violin that make you want to go screaming into the night kind of composer. Is there a particular group that you enjoy writing for like a age group or a type of choir? I write a lot for my church choir because as far as volunteer church choirs go, they're quite good. So I've been writing things that they can uh, access. I've, I've had a history of writing pieces for choirs that I sing in or have some kind of professional connection for. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I've stumbled across a favorite because they all have their, uh, their strengths and their interests. That's awesome. So what do, you, what do you enjoy doing when you're not making music? I have way too many hobbies. <laughs> So probably one of those I've been, I was, my mother was really into handcrafts and made sure I knew every handcraft that she did. 
So uh, I, I knit, I crochet, I do beadwork. Um, I like to read. I like to garden. It's summer now and the, the garden's going crazy and lots of things are coming in. I got really into German study over the pandemic because that was something I could do. And I mm -hmm. also found it just to be valuable as a, a, a musical resource, but also I have German heritage and it opened the door to understanding a little bit more about myself. Yeah. How are you, how are you studying it? Using Duolingo or something like that? Or what were you um, doing to study? I was using, there's this great app there. Can I recommend things on the show? Oh, please. Okay. <laughs> Didn't know if I was going to get in trouble. Uh, Seed Lang is Seed a Lang. new, yeah, S E E D L A N G is the new app that is actually focuses on listening and speaking rather than reading and writing. Uh huh. And that's how I really got got reasonable skills in in speaking and and listening. But other than that, I've done Italki lessons. I've done Duolingo. I've I'm at the point now where I can go on a website and make a lot of sense of things. So oh, sometimes I'll just read Wikipedia articles. And... Yeah, I actually just started studying German about a month ago. Uh, I Wonderful. took it in high school, but haven't touched it since and decided it was time to pick it back up. Cool. Yeah. So one last question for you before we take a quick break. Mm -hmm. uh, since you talk to a lot of composers and uh, as a conductor, Who's a com who's a living composer that you know that you think our listeners should go check out? Michael McGlynn has been his work both with as a con as a composer and with Anuna has been present for as long as I've been singing because I I sang his pieces one of my years in in college, um, but he's got really good musical intuition. He writes very well for voice. His history is also very interesting because he's been creating the choral Irish tradition. Hmm. And it goes back to some of the discoveries I made in Latvia um, of, of choral singing and tradition and um, that intersection. Because I think we, we have a nasty habit of of thinking about choral music, singing just being choral music, and it's really not. Um, so I think if you go look at his music, you're going to find a lot of different ways of doing things and also just find a lot of depth. Awesome. Michael McLynn was his name? McLynn. Uh, McLynn. Last name is M-C-G-L-Y-N-N. -N. Fantastic. Well, I'll go check him out. All right. Well, after we take a quick break here, we're going to listen to some of Justine's compositions. Hey, Steve here. I want to take just a moment of our time together to tell you about the easiest way to make and host a podcast. It's called Anchor. I use Anchor to make and host movable dough, and I've been extremely happy with the experience. They have creation tools on the site that help you create, record, publish, and share your podcast to multiple podcast streaming sources, including Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and more. The best part, it's absolutely free. No monthly cost, no hidden fees. So if you've been thinking about making a podcast, and you know you have, download the Anchor app today or visit anchor.fm to get started. Thanks for listening, and let's get back to Movable Dough. Welcome back. I'm talking today with Justine Kuntz. We're going to start first today with Two Rex Glorie for SATB Acapella Choir. So this is the third movement of a larger work, Te Deum. Uh, this seems to be an written in a way to evoke an older time and older musical style. Uh, what sort of ideas were you exploring with this piece? <laughs> this was a big piece. This was my graduate thesis when I was at Butler. And uh, I was finishing my degree in the 2015-2016 academic year. I had decided I wanted to write a choral masterwork for my thesis because I, I had bought myself the year to do that with. And... I was watching the political landscape really start to change that particular year. I've always loved the Te Deum text. It's a little bit like a, a Gloria on a couple of expressos. And I, I just love the effusiveness of it, but it was nagging at me. Can we have this? Does this expression work anymore? So the 
piece itself, it covers a lot of different styles. It's, it's a very questioning, probing piece. It's a difficult piece. Um, I think from an emotional and spiritual standpoint. But the Turex Gloria is the one a cappella movement in the middle that is supposed to reflect, as you said, the Renaissance sound and look back at a time, okay, this did work. Why isn't it working now? Mm. Awesome. Well, we're going to listen now to Turex Gloria performed here by singers from Butler University. All right, our next piece today, Impossible Distances for SATB Choir and Piano or Organ. In this recording, we'll have organ. So this piece uses text from poet Stephen Crane. Though scholars think that this poem is about Crane's confused views on religion, you believe the text is about our own personal struggles to fulfill our ambitions. What do you mean by this? I love this text very dearly. Uh, I was thinking if there was a text I was going to get tattooed on my body, this would be the one. <laughs> Um, the thing that grabbed me, I think it was in my early 20s, late teens, early 20s, when I first discovered this text, was it's got an ambiguity to it, too, of, um, can I read the text? Oh, please. Just make it less. Yeah. Um, there was set before me a mighty hill, and long days I climbed through regions of snow. When I had before me the summit view, it seemed that my labor had been to see gardens lying at impossible distances. 
I love the ambiguity in it because you're not sure, is this good? Is this bad? Is this happening on a small scale? Is this happening on a grand scale? Again, it's one of those things where you take away from it what you what you need. The rest of the poems in that series, the Black Riders, are all they're really dark. And this one, I guess you could classify as, as being one of those darker evocations, but it, it didn't grab me that way. And I think uh, in my <laughs> in my early 20s, I was feeling a little bit more optimistic about things and you know we'll, we'll, we'll push forward and have ourselves a grand journey and I think now I think it's been about 12 years since I wrote the, wrote the piece I view it differently mm, how would you say you view it now um that hill is really big <laughs> 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 and maybe you're never going to reach the gardens so do just you be- stop it just becomes an Im- impossible distance that's it. You know, I, I, I do love the way this piece ends. It slowly sort of unwinds as the distance gets longer and longer. And were you, what, what other sort of musical things were you doing with this poem since you're so invested in it? I'm one of those composers who takes a very small text and makes a lot of music out of it. So the, the first part of the piece, you're really going to hear just a statement of the text, and there's a contrapuntal section in the middle that's a little more, here's the journey. And my music has frequently been described as being ambiguous or ambivalent. Um, and I feel like when you, you'll, you'll feel that moment when you arrive at the summit. Again, you're, you're looking out and you're taking away the things that you need in that moment. Again, bringing it back to specifics. Uh, right. Yeah. Um, I'll also, the reason I included this piece is I think it was the first one that I composed that had this form of what I call contemplation and revelation, hmm. where the, the text is presented and thought about and transformed. And then there's a moment where you, you solve the text or you have, you have a revelation of, of what it actually means. And we're gonna hear it in another one of the pieces that I provided today too. Well, awesome. Well, I'm looking forward to re-listening to Impossible Distances uh, performed here by McDaniel College Choir.
All right, our next piece, Yet Gentle Will the Griffin Be. I love this piece for a children's chorus and piano. Fairly short, whimsical piece based on a poem by, you'll have to pronounce, help me pronounce this, Vachel? Vachel Lindsay? Vachel, like Rachel. Vachel, Vachel Lindsay. So when you're writing for children's voices, what sort of constraints do you think about and how do you make sure the kids would be successful in singing this? I think we underestimate kids. I think we tend to give them things that are simple, too simple, too basic, um, not a lot of meaning. Kids are deep. They'll make a lot of big intuitive jumps. They'll connect things that you didn't see a relationship between. I, I teach piano and guitar and I can't tell you how many times a kid has said something and I went, I never thought about that that way. <laughs> so I like doing things that are very imaginative and uh, in this case, very whimsical because it gives you a lot of, of play space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I actually really liked, you know, some more chromatic ideas than I often see in children's pieces. Uh, and I, I was really intrigued by that. So we're going to listen now to Yet Gentle Will the Griffin Be, uh, performed here by the Children's Chorus of Carroll County with Diane Jones, director. All right, and our last piece today, Mirabile Mysterium, uh, SATB Choir and Piano. So this wonderful Christmas anthem uses a rarely used Latin text to describe the birth of Jesus. Uh, with as much polyphony and full choral textures as you've written, would you say this is more of a concert piece or did you write it with a church choir in mind? No, it's a concert piece, definitely. And I wrote this while I was at Butler. My teacher was very insistent on trying to compose something that had a piano part that was not accompaniment. Hmm. So the, the piano in this is playing a very big role besides just supporting the choir. How would you describe the piano's role? Uh, definitely more collaborative. It's, if, if there are different characters in the piece, I would say it is also a character. So are there specific characters that you were trying to represent uh, from the nativity story? Not really. Um, so maybe that's a bad analogy then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I wanted the role of the piano to be uh, setting the mood, representing emotion in a way that's sometimes independent of what the choir is doing. Um, there's a part towards the end of the piece where it's really the soloist and the choir's just accompanying it. Mm. And you don't see too much of that these days. Yeah. So would you say, would is this the other piece you were talking about that has that contemplation revelation? Is that what you called it? That's it. Yeah. This is a, a great text and it talks about the duality of, of God made man. And there's a part of the text that's that's really bad math. It's these two things became one thing, but they're not one thing. They're two things, but they're one thing, but they're not one thing. They're two things. And I, I hit this 
part of the text and I really had no idea, what do I do? And you'll hear part of the piece is really thrashing out this idea. It's, I think I labeled it frustrated in the, in the choral score itself. So the piece then for me became the spiritual exploration of, well, how do we solve this bad math problem? <laughs> What's, what's the takeaway? What's the revelation? What's the solution? And the solution is, well, here we are. It happened. And you'll hear that in the piece, too. All right. Well, let's listen to Mirabile Mysterium, uh, performed here by Butler University Chorale, Dr. Eric Stark, director.
All right. Well, Justine, what are you working on now that you can tell us about? I'm getting ready to send off a commission for a church in Indianapolis. And the piece is a setting of a fragment of the Isaiah text. And the it's going to be for SATB and cello. It's on the theme of creation care. So the idea of, of taking care of, of nature. Okay. Uh, so that's the, the biggest thing that's coming up for me. Um, afterwards, I'm not really sure. I've got tons of things in my uh, on my computer that are in various states of half, three quarters, 90% finished. And I think it's time for me to go finish them and send them out into the world. <laughs> All right. Well, if my listeners want to learn more about you and your music, where are you located online? Where, they, where can they find you? They can find me at justinekuntz.com. And if you're just interested in listening, I have a SoundCloud where most of my, I think all of my recordings and my pieces are located. Fantastic. Are you on social media as well? I am on Facebook. On Facebook. All right. Well, hey, listeners, make sure you take some time to follow Justine on Facebook, but also follow this podcast on social media as well. We're on Instagram at Movable Dough Podcast, YouTube at Movable Dough Podcast, Twitter at Movable Dough, or you can join our Facebook group, Movable Dough Listeners. Send some insightful comments, share your favorite music, or just send a silly music meme. All are welcome to the Movable Dough Listeners group. Well, Justine, it has been a pleasure to get to know you today. Thank you for joining me on Movable Dough. Thank you for having me. It's been great talking with you. My guest today was composer Justine Kuntz. If you have a recommendation for a future guest or an idea for the show, please email me at movabledough at gmail.com. This is Steve Danielson. Keep the music moving. <laughs>